Welcome to The Gathering Place, where we ruminate on topics related to tourism, trails guiding, and the conservation of wild spaces. Welcome to The Gathering Place, everybody. Today, we have a guest that doesn't need much introduction if you are in the guiding industry or if you're, if you're interested in trekking in South Africa. Very experienced in the bush over 25 years, ranging from army tracker to lodge management to specialist guide, guide trainer, assessor, tracking trainer and assessor. One of the most qualified guides in the country with the Fagasa Scout qualification and owner of Nature Guide Training. Lee Guttridge, thanks for joining me. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me on board. Excellent. Um, so, Lee, I just want to start off in the early days in the guiding industry. Um, when you started out, how, how has everything changed now, um, just in terms of the size of the industry and the major role players, the, the training providers and those type of things? Jeez, it's changed dramatically. There's, uh, I, I guess it's kind of like the Jeep advert, you know, no limits. Okay. In those days, there was no, like, this is the rule and that is the rule. It was kind of each lodge made up its own rules as you went along. Um, I remember several of the different jobs I got as a youngster that they literally said to me, can you drive and have you shot a rifle and I was qualified then to take a rifle that afternoon on game drive Done. and take out a group of guests so yes it's, it's changed incredibly I mean the uh, the level of, of competence I think of the youngsters coming into the industry now compared to us wing nuts back 25 years ago it was like because there was no I suppose no official structured training back then so <laughs> whereas now no. Fagas has provided the system where you've got you know, yeah. high caliber of, of, of guides, yeah? Absolutely. Yeah, there, look, there, there wasn't really a structure. Um, look, Fagasa was just, just being conceptualized back then um, in the, the early 90s. So it, it really hadn't gained any momentum. There was no real reach or anything like that. But yeah, it was a, it was a, a great time to guide though. I can imagine. Yeah? Very, it just had a lot so of freedom. much freedom, yeah. I yeah. heard a while back somebody said that in the, in the 80s and 90s, if, to get a job, you, you'd have to drive the vehicle, drink a beer, and talk on the radio. At the, at same, the time. same time. and then you got the It was called man. multitasking, that was <laughs> fine, yeah. Um, yeah. Some of the guides from even my time and before my time, I've heard them say that they used to put their six pack in the little console in the center on the old Land Rovers, you know, the old the, yeah, the yeah, metal yeah. lid on the old Landys. I mean, our vehicles were held together with chewing gum and sellotape and bits of wire from the game reserve. I mean, there was no, like, a PDP, I mean, public driving permit, what what really? That? I mean, I didn't even have a driver's license, an official driver's license. Jeez, For my yeah. first few years as a guide, I had an army license. Shit. Yeah. But I'd, I'd never bothered to even go and change it in, and people never asked. What's an army license, just to drive? Yeah, well, when, when I was in the military, you, you do an army uh, driver's license test, you know, and then drive little okay, trucks okay. and things like that. So, so basically, I was guiding without even having a civilian driver's license at that time. It was crazy, you know. Yeah. So it's it's the, the professionalism has increased hundredfold. Massively, yeah. And for, and for Gossa has been a absolutely integral part of that, I think. So what what would you, you know, there's there's a lot of guides that that moan about Fagasa and say that Fagasa does nothing for mm. them, yet they are qualified with Fagasa and have a guiding job. What would you, you know, I, in a, a relative nutshell, what would your your answer to those people be? I, I think what they should do is take their Fagasa certificate and throw it away. They should burn it and throw it away. And then they should see how their movement within the industry comes mm. to an absolute halt. Yeah. Because Fagasa is the standard. It's yeah. the standard that field guides are held to, you know. Sure, people have their own skills and they have their own abilities with people. And Fagasa doesn't really have a lot on the soft skills side. Um, yes, there are guiding skills and, and things like that that are in, involved in the, the process. And Fagasa doesn't make a great guide a really great guide but it certainly gives standards structures and it gives us an opportunity as guides to to qualify in some way honestly without without the Fagasa certificates i have how would i ever profess to even be qualified yeah you know? and it, I, I mean to me what the big thing is it just provides a structure so there's yeah. always almost always something that you can still strive for yeah absolutely. Um, and work towards I, I love that and, and like right now i'm busy with another Fagasa qualification what are you doing? I'm doing the astronomy qualification. Oh, the new SPS. Yeah. Okay. yeah, why not? I mean, I want to keep learning and I want to keep... I, I think a lot of the guys that go, oh, Fagasa doesn't help and Fagasa sucks or whatever, you know, whatever they say. And I've had people have this argument with me, much to their eternal dismay because they get an earful for about six hours. But I've had guys do that and a lot of them I think... I mean, I'm going to go out on a limb here a bit, but I think 
that they just think they too good for this and they don't need this they don't need this qualification and that's fine but there's no need to slate it for those of us that do yeah. respect the qualification it, it's a standard it's something you can measure yourself against that's potentially people also feel threatened maybe because they're too scared to i don't know I'm yeah. just putting it up yeah, go for the qualification yeah. in case they don't make it yeah so you know I've, i recently had someone approach me going uh, i guided with so and so i did this and i did overlanding and i guided there and I don't need the qualification, but how do I just get level three quickly? Like, just, just want to quickly just get it. Sorry, it doesn't work like that, you know? Yeah. It doesn't matter who you, you guided with 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of guides I know that are like 15, 20 years in the industry, and they're still apprentices. No, yeah, no, it's... Because they just don't have the motivation to take that next step. And as I say, just because you've got a level three doesn't mean you're a great guide. No, sure. At all. I've met some level three guides that are... It just Pretty means average. you've got a, a minimum yeah. knowledge standard. There we I go. Suppose. That's yeah. it. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Now, mm. with Nature Guide, when did you start Nature Guide training? Uh, it's a bit of a strange story, but it, initially it was put together as an internal training company for a reserve I worked in in the Waterberg years ago. Okay. Um, they're busy feeding on their Nyala fruits. Yeah. It's awesome. So, so yeah, it was put together as an internal training company for the first couple of years. Uh, that was back in about 2002. So, what are so, we now? Uh, 20 so you years were, ago. Because yeah. you were head guided into Vinny, so you started the internal training. I, and I, then was, it's... I was the, the training manager for, okay. for the safari team, yeah. So, yeah, that, uh, that started as an internal company. We, we sort of registered it as a company. And then after over a decade there, I finally left and took the company with me to, to further my training experience sure. and, and things like that so so yeah so it's about it's about 18 years now really that, that i've been doing this so did it, type did it change from interveni to nature guide training when you came down to the low fault Was yes that yeah, change yeah. The yeah name took place that's it i, I changed the name from interveni nature guide training to nature guide training yeah okay that's it yeah. and and, um, re, and re registered it so yeah. okay so obviously where you operate now is a lot different from where you were mm. when you started interveni nature guide training what what about the Waterberg do you, like, what characteristic do you miss most? Jeez, oh, the Waterberg's incredible. Um, the human history there is amazing. Uh, the, the botany is absolutely mind-blowing. I mean, jeez, the, the flower lists that I put together there of species that I found were, like, in the four and five hundreds. Uh, there were over 230 tree species on that, that small reserve. Wow, that is it's incredible. Yeah. Crazy, yeah. I mean... There are more trees on 23,000 hectare, 23, hectares than occur in Europe, species. You know, it was oh, just crazy. insane. Jeez. So it's kind of, the Waterberg is, is the arid west meets the Mesic east. And yeah, so you can crossover. have Cape grassbirds in the valleys and desert cesticulars down in the, the grasslands. Mm -hmm. And then you go to the top of the hills and you've got Cape buntings. And, you know, it, it was just fantastic bird life it's that i suppose that vertical <coughs> movement that makes it so diverse eh? the, absolutely the okay so you've got the east and, east and the west and the rain in some of those areas was up to 1200 mils in a year Gee. then some of the lower areas which were further south in the reserve it was like you'd be lucky if you got 400 mils in a year yeah, it was like ridiculous yeah. the changes and then you've got the lowlands, you've got the scarp slopes, you've got the cliff faces, you've got all these incredible valleys with massive Eugene Murray cycads and just, it was just like a, it's almost like going into like a Jurassic Park type thing. Jewish. You know, you're going into these like valleys and the trees are growing over you and the cycads and Like an tree enchanting ferns. sort of wonderland yeah, yeah. Type Lord of the Rings vibe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah it's kind of like that. The, no orcs though. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, it just it was a, an amazing amazing habitat yes the animals were wonderful I, th I think um as with any big reserve you're going to find rhinoceros or buffalo or whatever it may be but sure. but yeah i just that's was i was enchanted by the landscape i think that's really what got me okay. that landscape and how old the landscape seems yeah a, a two billion year old mountain range Jeez. and you, you're just putting your hands on these rocks and you're like wondering what what yeah. else has been passed here and and you know who's walked in this area it's just amazing okay awesome. yeah and now yeah. with the, the move to the low felt, um, you currently have a camp in Baluli Nature Reserve, uh, yeah. in Gala Camp. What, uh, you know, compared to Waterberg, what, what factors do you really enjoy here? Oh, I, I think here it's the anything can happen factor. You being know, part of the biggest system. Yeah, be, being in the Waterberg, we had a fenced off game reserve that we were in. And, you know, you kind of knew that you had your seven lions and you knew you had your 
rhinoceroses and you knew there was this herd of elephants in this area and that herd of elephants in that area. Mm. Here, you've got absolutely no idea what's going to happen. You, you know, we, we wake up and there's a pride of lions outside our tent here or male lions we've just never seen before or yeah. um, clans of hyenas coming through that you're thinking, geez, I mean, I didn't even know we had that many hyenas in the area. Yeah. This is wonderful. Or right. like looking out of the, the front of the tents and seeing 200 elephants just right in front of the camp. Absolutely incredible. So, mm. so that's like, I, I've got no idea day to day what is going to happen mm. next, which I think is wonderful. And of course, being part of this open ecosystem, um, the animals, they ebb, they flow. It's like the tides, you know. Mm. Mm. In comes a tide of lions, out goes the tide of everything else. You know, or the elephants will arrive and then there's... And it, you, we actually talked about this a bit earlier. And is it quite noticeable that when there's a lot of lion activity in your hyena numbers? Jeez, yeah, it's unbelievable. Really? When, when, when we have like a pride roaring over the river from our camp and a pride roaring near our camp and we hear some other lions roaring and it may be males, maybe females. It's really hard to, to pick up on the roars. I know what the, the rules are, but... Yeah, yeah. You know, there's so many times where I've been convinced it's a male lion calling and it ends up being a female. But, you know, when there's that many lions calling around the camp, like we don't even see a hyena track. They just, they just vanish. I think they pack the kids up and they go hide head the for a, for yeah, a go, go find a hill somewhere. It's just amazing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so these days, even though you're still conduct conducting um, Fugasa field guide training, you're focus seems to have shift, shifted quite dramatically to the tracking side of things. What sort of brought that on and yeah, and when did this happen? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm currently married to an addicted tracker, so she's always out there tracking. So that's been a great sort of motivation to get out and track more. But I've always been involved with tracking. I don't think that's really changed too much. Okay. Um, back in the early 90s, I became a tracker for the army. So that was sort of my introduction to nature in, in this sort of sense, being in the Kruger ecosystem, was actually tracking. So, but yeah, it's, I think in terms of the Fugasa training, a, a good few years ago, I brought it down to a couple of courses a year. And I really love that interaction and being able to stay immersed in the Fugasa system and still help the industry by putting out some, some good quality young guides. Um, that to me is still very important, and it's a, a, a big chunk of our year. Almost mm. a, a third like of our a third of our year is focused just on training new generations of Fagasa students. But the tracking just it, it's just grown and grown and grown. It's becoming a bigger thing around the world. Um, traveling with Kersey, uh, we've I mean we've gone all over the world tracking together. It's just it's just such a beautiful thing to do, and, and it's so challenging and also so rewarding. And it can be incredibly frustrating. So, I mean, you can go through every emotion under the sun in just one lion trail. Yeah, you know, true. like you, it starts suddenly just flowing on this trail, and you're like, "Yeah, you know, I'm doing this." And then it turns into chaos and the hunting and this gravel and you know, feeling. You know? Yeah, I heard very well. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, and you can have all these these challenges thrown at you continuously. Trekking is just challenge after challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and I love the discovery as well, the opportunity to learn new things and. Like, I'm looking around at these fallen fruits, I'm wondering, well, who chewed that one? And what would the difference be between that and that? You know, so there's all these, uh, I think my inquisitive nature mm. is definitely sparked up by this whole tracking thing because it's, it's endless. It's absolutely endless. And I think out of <laughs> almost anybody I know, I think you've got the most inquisitive nature <laughs> out of anyone I've ever met. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's never a <laughs> dull you, moment think, when you're with Lee. You, it's like... You actually don't get a, t a t chance to rest when you with you because it's always like, what is this? What is this? What is this? Ah, check this, check this. Which is great, and, yeah. and I think that's why your guide courses are so popular, and why you're held in such high regard because of the energy and that constant childlike enthusiasm when it comes to discovering new things. You're calling me childish. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, no, I I, ab I absolutely love the new discoveries. So I mean, my guided walks. I mean, we did we did a, a guided walk out of camp, camps that way. Um, and I think we had walked for three and three quarter hours and we got to the gate from the fireplace. <laughs> so we were in camp for three and three quarter hours Jeez. photographing and identifying and I had tree books and tracking books and I was trying to show the students how to use the books and we saw incredible two different types of trapdoor spiders and a whole load of bird sign and 
the small animals had come into the camp and it just it was like it was ridiculous and i mean i suppose yeah. i mean we've talked about the substrate in your camp numerous times because it's probably the best substrate in the world for, for <laughs> tracking and hence why it takes three four hours to walk to the gate because yeah. it's just it's you, you can unreal. literally fingerprint a baboon in this place these whirls on the on the skin of a baboon on their fingers and on their hands you can actually see those whirls Perfect, of the yeah. skin ridges in in the tracks it's yeah. just so yeah, so, I mean, that substrate is just ridiculous. So it's the perfect camp for what Nature Guide Training does mm. and for what Original Wisdom does, Kersey's company. So, okay. yeah. Um, you mentioned you started off as a, an army tracker um, mm. and you were based in the Kruger National Park. I think yep. in those days it was patrolling the borders with mm. because of the Mozambicans coming through and things like that, eh? Yeah, yeah. Um, tell me, obviously you were focused on people, but you must have had some pretty interesting animal encounters sure. during that while yes. following people eh? plenty eh jeez uh, and and a lot of the time you'd be tracking during the day but then if you had intel that there was going to be some kind of a crossing or an incursion then you'd operate at night so you'd be walking around in the pitch black you've got your rifle you know you're kind of like stumbling along falling over things i mean one time i i was following a trail and i saw a gap between two bushes so i went into the gap and it was the bum of a hippo so i walked straight into the bottom of a hippo and i bounced back and like this thing that I was trying to turn, I climbed over my friends and left. Um, so, you know, things like that. I mean, we were surrounded by lions the one night and we spent the whole night sat back to back, just periodically firing a shot from the rifles into the air to keep the lions away. Because a lot of the lions at that stage were hunting people. Uh, of course, yeah. That was yeah. the heyday of man. Yeah, it Kruger. was because the, the, the 20 years of, of conflict in Mozambique between Renamo and Frelimo were just coming to an end. What was that, early 90s? Eh? 90 uh, that was 90. 90 394 that they were things were calming down in mozambique and i think they came to a, an agreement then okay but for the 20 years prior to that they'd been at war so there yeah. were so many refugees unarmed people coming across the border that the the lions certainly yeah, took advantage I, I of. i believe that. at that time kruger had was the biggest man-eating lion problem in africa yeah. um it traditionally tanzania there's there's a lot of man-eating that goes on but um i remember at the I was a kid and watching a carte blanche episode of these they'd filmed this pride of lions that was sitting well it used to sit at a specific place on the fence that was a crossing point and literally these lions would just eat mozambicans that, that's what they did terrible but yeah so we had problems with lions like that because mm. i mean i'm no yeah. different from a mozambican sure. they, you know they just would try their luck wherever they could mm -hmm. so yeah it was pretty scary the one pride was at least 17 lions that were around us the whole night it was, yeah, it was very scary oh, very but it was yeah it's, yeah it's all though. part of it so yeah it was great fun <laughs> so yeah but yeah we, it, we're all, it was mainly tracking people but geez there's so much time for looking at animals and you know you're on a trail and you see something awesome so yeah lots of and you i mean you were turn. camped out in the bush in a little <sighs> primitive trail yeah backpacking eh? primitive trail you, just, you got your backpack they give you seven days worth of food and you'd put those seven days worth of food in various caches so you didn't have to carry them everywhere um, but you take enough with you for your patrols and you patrol out, you go walk for a day. We used to build little temporary bases, um, cut a bit of grass, lay it on the ground under a nice shade sort of bush. Awesome. And and you just sleep under a what bush a for yeah weeks at a time. Eh? They come out and reprovision you every seven days. Um, sometimes you'd be out for a week or a week and a half and other times you'd be out for like 25 days. It was amazing. Wow. Yeah. Uh, people pay a lot of money to do that in Kruger. Shippers, no? yeah. Jeez. And, and we could just go anywhere we wanted. There was literally we had to radio in every day and give a report as to where we were situated. But it was just honestly, we just walked and walked and walked. It was great. Yes. I mean, from the croc to the Sabi was the stretch that I worked. Okay. And our unit was about 55 soldiers. And so we had to cover that whole area, 55 Jeez. of us. So, oh, but yeah. you were in groups of two or three, groups I'd imagine. Four. Eh? Four. Groups of four, yeah. Track teams are normally five, but we were in groups of four. Okay. Yeah. So now, yeah, you're not tracking humans that much anymore but mm -hmm. animals these days what what would you say is the most challenging and or rewarding animal to trail that you for you gosh there's, there's look i mean everyone's gonna i think everyone would kind of lean towards like something really difficult like the soft-footed animals like lions and leopards and i really do enjoy tracking them but i also love trailing elephants because the trail can be wonderfully easy and it can just be a really nice bit of time out in the bush um and then to to get the approach right with elephants and sit and view them doing what they normally do i really enjoy that but elephant tracks as as we've discussed in the past can also be very 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 mm. tricky 
Um, if you think of the areas we walked this morning with those flattened game trails, the grasses yeah, is just so flattened. Anything, yeah. And, and you know to to search for the elephants by looking for feeding sign and you know you see oh there's that species of tree over there and that one's been stripped so you go to that strip branch and see if you find a leaf below and i really love that as well i enjoy that a lot um so i just think generally in any tracking really I, i'm not mm. too fussed yeah, whether i'm tracking a, a white-tailed deer in connecticut or what did you Whatever. do recent yeah. Bis bison in poland yeah we we actually went into the I think they call it the primeval forest, uh, Bialo Vieja, something like that. I don't know. Okay. They they have some words there with lots of funny little, little Different letters, letters and strange yeah, strange and letters. And, but uh, the the forests in Poland, we went looking for bison, for European bison, um, and with the particular focus to track and find, which we did on okay, on several occasions, and that was just absolutely wonderful as well. I mean you can imagine that everything around me is new every plant is new it was supposed to be like feet of snow but there was no snow okay. so we were tracking in leaf litter Jeez. so it was quite quite tricky and yeah we we followed deer trails we followed wolf trails you've done quite a bit of tracking in snow in the states <coughs> yeah I is have. it i mean maybe i'm ignorant but to me it seems like it would be very simple i mm. mean or is it does it get quite confusing when there's a lot of traffic and yeah look we i mean Chris and i have trailed things like coyote on, on our snowshoes and off we go through places like the um you know the lovely parts of massachusetts and places that we go to track and yeah it can be quite confusing i mean if if the tracks are really deep well mm -hmm. you need to know the stride of the animal and the lengths of the animal and the gates mm, of the animal because mm. you can't actually see the footprint so yeah yeah you just seeing yeah I mean, I've, we've, we've trailed links out there that that all we were seeing was gentle depressions in the snow because it had snowed lightly over the trail and okay. what one of the guys showed me which was fantastic was that you start to scoop the snow around your track okay and then you just gently brush off the snow from the top because that's that track has warmed the snow for a split second and it freezes into ice so eventually you can blow off the snow wow. and you can pick the tracks up out of the ground and you can look through the spore of a lynx i mean a lynx's foot is like this it's just humongous it's for like such a small cat pretty much yeah, yeah absolutely and things like that were just you know there's so many of these little wonders when you're oh. out in the snow but look if there's a thin little if there's a little layer of snow geez, every track is perfect you know yeah. and it's really not difficult to do um but as soon as there's been a bit more snow or there's layers of snow on top of your trail that you're trying to follow i mean we've tracked wolf where we were trudging through thigh deep chest deep snow on our snowshoes and sinking and going th like post holding through the wolves i mean are they light enough man, to get that on they run across that snow it's incredible they've got these massive splaying feet i'm sure that they've got a bit of webbing in between those toes and they we i mean yeah sure they might sink chest deep but the animals are clever so the first guy breaks the trail and the other ones follow in it yeah, i mean coyotes we've seen where they actually follow human activity and they run on the trail of people because it's been because it's already been compacted Jeez, so yeah you know they, they're adapted for that it's just yeah have where else um have you got any plans for any other international tracking oh yeah programs i know when i spoke to kosi she her bucket list or where she really what she really wanted to track was um tigers in siberia mm. and i'm Obviously, you are very excited about that too. Any anything else that jumps to mind? That I, I I would like to track tigers in India as well, but the problem there is there's, there's such a, a lot of restriction and, and walking. Is like, yeah, oh, it's yeah. really difficult. Um, I'd love to somehow get permission to follow tiger trails yeah, in the jungles sure. in India. That'd be awesome. I know in Nepal. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but in Nepal is it a national park called Bardia National Park that I did a bit of research into a while back, and apparently. There you they they offer walking for tigers to go and look for tigers, so yeah. that could be a good place to, to investigate. Yeah. Um, that would be awesome to do as well. So yeah, I, yeah I'm just kind of happy to go anywhere and do track and sign and trailing and follow things and just learn. So I yeah, suppose. Yeah. yeah, and I've started the, the cyber tracker process in the US. I've, I've started attending assessments, um, but it's like it's you know I'm going straight back to to grade one again. You know, and it, everything is new and everything is. How does that work? If you can clarify for me, because I'm not quite sure. How does it work? Um, the cyber tracker system. If you qualify in South Africa, 
you, you're not recognized anywhere else. I mean, how does it's no, I, I don't, I don't think that's, I mean, when I go to the US as a senior tracker in the cyber tracker system, I'm certainly not treated like sure, somebody who's no, just no, arrived. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, the guys are really quite respectful of the, the qualification, even though it's from another part of the world. And the same if we have senior trackers come here from Britain or from mm -hmm. Europe or from the United States. I mean, we, you know, so, so it's not that it's not recognized. If you, if you know the principles, if you understand the structures behind tracking, they are very transferable. Mm. Um, so in the US, for example, the, the cyber tracker committee, they, they allowed me to go straight on to senior level assessments. Okay. So... For, so it is for recognized both, for track and sign and trailing. Um, I haven't done a trailing assessment in the United States, so I, I, I really don't know. I'd have yeah. to ask them. But I mean, I'm sure I'm that sure. will. Yeah. I mean, the principles there, you know, it's yeah. the same, so it's, it shouldn't be much different. Yeah, I'd imagine. But once again, I mean, yeah. I don't. I don't want to speak out of turn because I don't know what yeah. they would okay. be doing. But uh, yeah, it's a, a cyber tracker certificate is recognized. It's it's like if you're a senior tracker, you're recognized, or if you're a level three tracker or a professional tracker. It's recognized. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, with, with a lot of these things, you've got to kind of learn those species. I mean, I wouldn't want to go to the United States and start shooting my mouth off about track and sign. For sure. For sure yeah. When I haven't even seen half those species, you know, I mean, there's people there that, I, I mean, curse you, I see them, she picks up a, a chewed nut off the ground and it's like, oh, looking at the dentition of this and this, and I'm like, okay, good. You carry on with that. You know, so I mean that's a whole new learning process. I've got to go. I've got to learn to walk before I can run. Sure. So, yeah. Um, we were talking before about what you guys have been busy with now during lockdown. Um, the the online tracking courses that you you're starting to put together. I mean, obviously tracking like trails guiding, which we're more involved in, is a very practical um, activity. But how how valuable do you think this on new online section is going to be with for people that actually can't get into the bush? Well, for people who can't get into the bush, it's priceless. I suppose that's It'll never are. be a substitute for time in the bush. But it's going to give you one heck of a foundation. Yeah. Um, we, when we started writing the first book in this, this uh, sort of the first lesson in this, this series of, of courses, we were kind of thinking, oh, 100 pages, maybe 150 pages or something. 107. Then next thing was 190. Then it was 220. Then it was almost 300 now it's i think it's 340 pages or something and kirsty and i have put is this the manual section? this is just the manual without even the workbooks or yeah this is just the first manual so and it will be online and it will also be available as something to like like a hard copy like a, a, a weight to put on your desk or something but it's um it, there's so much in there that draws from the essence of how we track and our passions and ideas. And Kirsty and I are very different in some ways. You know, she has a lot of f focus on one thing and I maybe focus more on another thing. And that together has now all been put into one book. That's so, cool. and, and this is, it's kind of a, it's a how-to. There's, I, th I think we've got something like 10 daily routines, which are the kind of things you could do every day if you chose to. And there's close to 30 um, shorter testing routines that you just would do maybe once and it'll be fully interactive with us we're gonna basically have this whole interactive platform on facebook on a, a closed group so only people that are doing the course and and we're going to be introducing all our new discoveries on that facebook page we're going to be interacting with the students some of their assignments are to go out and do certain things document them photographically and then bring them to the facebook page so that we can moderate and interact and that is all going to be done in a very open way so that the other students who are on the course and maybe aren't at that level yet they haven't done that exercise yet they're going to benefit from that too Huge, yeah, to so that. so you're getting all of this info before you've even done some of these sections and and obviously you do what you want to do you don't have to do every single exercise you don't have to do every core routine but we're giving basically 40 different tools to use to build your tracking skills ranging from very very basic very introductory sort of stuff right through to techniques that are really only practiced by experts or professionals Jeez. so it's, it's so quite yeah, broad yeah? that sounds like a fantastic way to start i mean to yeah. build a foundation absolutely um yeah great and and if you go through this process 
and then arrive to attend a cyber tracker type evaluation or a trails guide course yeah. or a Fagasa field guide course you're going to be streets ahead of, of the other else, chaps yeah. who are starting the process and learning how to look at a track what what do we look for how do we start the process of separate, separating out different groups of animals you know there's just so many introductory things basic skills i think that's the most yeah. important thing because there there isn't anything like that at the moment well, from Not what that i'm I know. aware of no um, um there's all obviously yeah. the field guides you know identifying tracks and yeah. is practical tracking i think that one book that tell, goes into a bit more depth about On the, the trailing side the trailing. yeah that, that's great yeah but there's not otherwise there's nothing really that jumps to mind yeah this is this is an overall looking at tracking this is track and sign it's trailing it's putting them together it's learning the abcs and then piecing together those sentences that, mm -hmm. that we will build in nature as we go and track so okay. yeah it's it's exciting i'm i'm really excited to get this launched and hopefully in the next very short while Good. Be able to, yeah. We've discussed this. I'm definitely going to be one of your first customers. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so, okay, now we've so you've got the online section that you guys have been working mm -hmm. on and are going to launch mm -hmm. soon. Um, what, and I know Kirsty was talking about um, trailing intensives and track and sign intensives. Mm -hmm. What other, so, so maybe just give us a little rundown on those courses that you do here at, uh, at Angala. Yeah, they, so a, a track and sign intensive, or a, a, we call it a tracking intensive. Uh, would be about 12 days and then we normally add on a few days for trailing assessments for a limited number of the participants so we work on eight people on a track and sign intensive um, or a tracking intensive and then only four do the trailing component so basically it's first come first served okay. but we focus heavily on the track and sign and we throw in lots of trailing while we're doing whenever there's an opportunity we go trail whatever we find so by the end of it everyone has had good exposure to the trailing side but the main focus is getting them ready to assess them on the cyber tracker system. So okay. that'll normally be around day 11 or 12, somewhere there, that we will run a, an evaluation. So, you know, the guys, they, they learn a new, and we have had people come from all over the world to do this, mm. um, from Spain and Holland and the United States and Britain and South Africans, plenty. You know, and it's just, it's the amount of things that they learn in a short time period, it's really intense. That's why we call it an intensive. intensive yeah. And then trailing, we only work with a small, gr a small group of four. So if we do a trailing intensive, it's normally about nine days. It'll vary, but about nine days. And that is all four people are practicing the art of trailing to hopefully be assessed at the end of the process if they choose to do so. And you, you and Kirsty run these courses together always, eh? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's amazing. I mean, to have two senior trackers. How many senior trackers are there in the world? I don't actually know. I'm, I'm guessing 30 or 40. Okay. Maybe 50. I don't know. Um, and and the, I think the vast majority of the senior trackers are probably from our local Shangan community, as far as I know, okay. I'd imagine. But the number in the US is growing beautifully as well, especially the specialists, like track and sign specialists or trailing specialists. Okay. That number is growing in the US, but you've got to have the track and sign specialist combined with the trailing specialist to be a senior tracker. Yeah. Yeah. So if you take all the specialists, well, there's, there's quite a number of people now. I mean, it's really, again, things we talk about all the time, but how the tracking culture is growing in a huge way. Huge. I mean, people are just, it's, it's on everybody's lips. It's, I mean, from our point of view, um, running trails guide courses, it's something that we kick ourselves that we didn't start concentrating earlier because it's, it is the foundation for a lot of things, that, well, especially when you're out walking. Mm -hmm. Most of our interpretation is based on track and sign and, and it's pretty much going out there and not being able to, you know, if you, if you can't identify tracks, you, you're reading a newspaper without being able to read. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's crazy and it seems like it's, 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 a, it's a fundamental. A <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... So we are now pushing track and sign and trailing to all our students from day one. Um, and that's obviously in the South African guiding context, mm -hmm. but I mean, worldwide as well. I and mean, you talk about people coming from Spain, from the mm -hmm. US, from- it's huge there, huge. In Spain. Yeah, really. massive. Spain, Holland, I mean, and, and within the cyber tracker system, we've got English guys writing books on tracking and putting them up and they cyber tracker senior trackers. And in Holland, we've got specialists oh, writing books in Dutch. And then we've got German guys writing in, like, the, in the U.S. There's all the new tracking books that are coming out are cyber tracker evaluators and senior trackers. Okay, great, great. It's amazing. Like, there's, it's just such a, I think we're all just so thirsty for, for knowledge and for mm. new information and, and it's all so passionate about it. Yeah. It's also, I think it's, it's part of this global trend to go back to basics. And this is one of the core skills mm. 
when we were hunter gatherers, if you didn't know how to do this, you weren't going to last very long. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you'd a lot be of people, a gatherer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of people are like, for example, um, sort of survival, bushcraft, all of that type of thing is, is seems to be getting more. Yeah, and more it is. It is kind popular. of in, yeah. You, the, the survivalists are looking into the tracking, and you know the bushcraft guys that know how to cook everything up and make a cell phone out of that branch <laughs> over there. I mean, they're getting into the tracking as well. It's you know, and I, I just think that people have just found it. It's just lovely to go out into nature. Mm. You don't even have to go far. You don't need a big area. And tracking is just the glue that holds everything together. Mm. When I'm out there guiding, if I, I see a battalier or, you know, it's perched in a tree and there's a tawny perched in the next tree, I'm like, oh, tracking yeah. sign, man. It's right there. there. There's a sign that something's going on. These are the first two birds mm. that will come into a kill, typically, especially in this Kruger Park ecosystem because we've got battaliers here. Um, you know, it's just, a, there's so many things. That everything is around tracking flower ID okay but well, look at the seeds and then you find a seed on the ground and everything comes back to tracking for me it's basically crazy. just yeah being observant essentially that's what yeah you know, it, it's it's being a naturalist being a an all-rounder and it's hard to do that without having some mm. tracking knowledge you know yeah, so, agreed. yeah have you got um i mean tracking have you got a good story that, about a specific trail? Anything that stands out in terms of a very rewarding or challenging or exciting trail? I guess... Yeah, there's a few that have really been quite amazing and I was going to focus on the one where I got my senior level in tracking. But, um, but there's another one that I'll... I'll okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, how many hours have we got? Uh, couple yeah so anyway I'll, I'll abbreviate this but an hour of battery left yeah yeah so back some time back uh, I would guess in the late 90s yeah it was late 90s I tracked closely uh, worked closely with a tracker by the name of Ben and Bloom. and Ben and I used to take the trails together as much as we could I mean back then there was no like you know don't leave your guests it's like kind of see you later I'm going yeah, tracking yeah, yeah. you know <laughs> off we went through the bush you know, you had only gone 15, 20, 30 minutes at a time, but we were trailing a leopard and we'd let the, the guests sit under the shade of a tree and they were relaxing up the side of a road and they all had some water, they were fine. And off we went. So we go down this riverbed and Ben is on the trail following this female leopard. And, and like, you've got to try and picture it like this riverbed with high, like fairly high banks. They were a bit more steep. The riverbed itself was very rocky with little patches of sand and then rock and then sand and rock and there were lots of tiny little nooks here you know the little water yeah, nooks yeah, here yeah. Um, these little shrubs they're like a, a very shrubby little plant and they were very stunted because whenever the floods came they broke so they would coppice and they'd be these little stunted green things so anyway Ben's on the trail and I'm actually more like watching out for Ben and I'm keeping a, an eye ahead watching for the, this little leopard and at a point there you know I'd see the trail and I'd point him that the trail's there and he'd do his thing and so we kind of worked together on it but I was more of a security officer for Ben on that trail. But at a point, he just froze. He just like stopped. And he just very slowly put his hand up and he went like this to me. Like, come here. And I just, I like, Ben, what is it, bud? You know, he's like, he just did this again. And he just stood dead still. And I thought, okay, something is going on here. I'm not sure if I like this. But I sat down on the bank and I just gently slid over the edge. And I had my rifle in my hands and I'm now approaching Ben very carefully. And I'm like, Ben, what is it? And he's just doing this with his finger. And I'm like, okay. So I get right up to Ben at his shoulder. And he just slowly puts his hand out to point. And he goes like this at his feet. <laughs> and the leopard was under a nuxia at his feet. He had come down the riverbed quietly. And she had, obviously she was laying in the shade and she just, didn't she felt that if she laid still he would pass her by or something and unfortunately well or fortunately ben had such incredible eyes that ben unfortunately passed away but uh, he was just watching you know and, and so we both sort of like looked looked away okay don't let the leopard know we've actually seen it so now what he did was he moved me in front of him with the rifle and then he could turn around and see how to get out of there without falling down he didn't want to turn his back on the leopard and he didn't want to try to reverse because all these round pebbles and boulders and stones he could easily have taken a tumble so now i'm kind of like i've got the rifle here and i'm trying not to look at the leopard now ben is leading me out by the shoulders 
very slowly and watching where my feet go and guiding me out. And she's just so, watching. And you she like was this. laid like, if I put my arm out like this and I dropped a stone, it would have hit her on the head. Unreal. It was unbelievable. It was absolutely fantastic. And so we backed out, and when we were about 10 meters away, that leopard just took gone. out of there. She was yeah. gone because, you know, she'd like realized that she'd had a close call and we somehow hadn't seen her and we retreated out. She must have been terrified, yeah, but, sure. but I tell you, I, I, I was a bit terrified myself. I'm and, sure. and being Jeez. that close to a wild leopardess, I mean, I know what those things can do. Hey? Yeah, I know. So, yeah, so that okay. was a fantastic experience, yeah. I often think how, how often leopards see us while walking. Um, every game. Probably, probably every walk we do. Yeah, and they just sit day. there and they just go down like this and let us pass and then yeah. carry on. Eh? There, there was a leopard that, that I worked with when I was a, a guide in, in the Sabi Sands at Sabi Sabi. And this big female, the Magonzwan, the Hamakop female, you'd see her trail going down the road. And you'd be driving along and you're following this fresh trail and you look and you look at nothing and you drive and then next thing there's no tracks. And then you just watch your rearview mirror. she step back out onto the road behind you. She couldn't continue. She was yeah, always did it. She'd, uh, she'd just step off the road and lay down flat. I, I think we must be seen every walk, every yeah. uh, the amount of times leopards have just walked straight past <laughs> our camp. And we find the tracks there. Mm. But we only see them one in ten yeah. times, you know. No, I mean, I'm just the amount of tracks you see in the low felt. I mean, you literally can't walk more more than twenty minutes without crossing yeah. a leopard track. You, I mean, you commented on it this morning. I mean, the sheer number yeah. of leopard here on the banks of the Olifant River. This area is crazy, I mean. crazy. This rugged terrain, the the, the rugged felt, the Olifant rugged mm. felt. This broken, you know, on, that, on the Olifant's backpack trail, it's almost impossible to walk on a path along the river without a leopard track on that path yeah it's like every path has got leopard tracks it's, it's, it's amazing yeah. largely like that here so yeah. yeah yeah well i suppose the only time we don't see leopard tracks here is when the elephants have come through in their hundreds and they've obliterated and every it, track yeah, of yeah, everything yeah, yeah. so yeah, it's yeah they 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 really are all around us here um we had one night a few days ago it's just there was just leopard calling everywhere with at least three different locations of leopards calling. I've never heard as many leopard calls in one evening in my life. Sure. It was just crazy. I think there was a maybe a female in Estrus and she was roaring and a male was responding to her. And then I think there was another male over the river responding to Jeez. this whole... It's fantastic. Did yeah. you used to... Were the leopards in, in Tabeni quite relaxed? Did you used to no. see them much? Or? No, unfortunately, the, the leopard there was, uh, I, I think... After my more than a decade there, I saw an average of about one a year. Okay. Normally a sighting of way up on a hillside. You know, you pick up the eyes at night, you know, with the, with the spotlight. You mm. might see some eyes and you look with your binoculars and you see that it's a leopard. Just but anything from the hunting history. And mm, hunting yeah. history and also the game reserve was, it's an isolated little oasis for animals. In a lot of it is old farmlands that were changed and then all around them there's cattle and game farms there's people with crops there's people farming golden wildebeest and black impalas and not anymore red warthogs and i don't know what else <laughs> they were farming there so so yeah the animals unfortunately the leopards we, we didn't we didn't even want to habituate them yeah because of because the, all that would happen is we'd, we'd realize that people are friendly and then it would be shot so mm. yeah so Look, we had incredible lion, lion viewing there. The lions were um, Itosha males, I think. And I think the females came from the central Kalahari game reserve. So they were oh, wow. just humongous. Yeah. And I mean, some of those, those lion sightings we had were just unbelievable. I mean, it was just, mm. you know, it was amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, the lions, but you know, you talk about those uh, sort of windswept, perfectly posed lions in the blow Serengeti drives. with their hair blow dried back. The lions in the Waterberg were like that. They were just huge and they, they weren't other pride, so they weren't scarred and ripped mm. up. I mean, to be a lion here, you're a winner. Yeah. I mean, if you're an adult lion in this place, you have beaten the odds mm. big time, you know, because... The competition I mean, is... Yeah, there's just insane, so many... Yeah. I mean, what do they say? I think, I think they say the average lifespan of a male lion is like a couple of years if you average out all the mortalities. Oh, yes, right. a successful lion might live for 12 or 13 or 14 years. But the majority are dying. But most lions die at a, a couple of months old or, or maybe two years old when they leave their, mm -hmm. their natal pride. So, I mean, the animals here are just hardcore. I mean, you see a lion here with like its eye on its cheek and its nose half <laughs> torn off and it's missing an ear and there's no tail. You but know, that guy has fought for that. That's what a lion should be. I mean, that's, you know. Agreed. Yeah, it's amazing. Amazing. Agreed. Yeah. It's, like, it's almost like a dugger boy. Like I often think of hunters who trophy hunters who are going for the you know the long the the width of the horns whereas 
I would like a scrum cap with like a broken horn. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, if I was going to go and hunt a buffalo, and it's the same with the, he's, he's broken he's his horns off, man. beating up other exactly. buffaloes. I mean, that, that's, that's a hardcore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like a little helmet on. Yeah, yeah. no, amazing. Huh? Yeah, that's, that's one of. The, but that's another of the amazing things about this place. If you see an animal here, it's a winner. Mm. It's, it's like genetically, this is like the current peak of mm, that species, mm. and I think here, because of the density of, of leopard and lion along the river. It's just, I mean, these are just incredible prime, animals. I suppose this is all prime, prime real estate. So Big time, yeah. So, are really so these are not just the best of their species because they've survived and made it through. They've chosen the most difficult place mm, to do it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the density of leopards here is ridiculous. I, I, don't, I don't have a clue mm -hmm. how many leopards are here. But I, I do know that if, if it's not many, they can walk, eh? They're all over <laughs> yeah, the place. Yeah, yeah, Their no. tracks are everywhere. I mean, like the whole, mm. the population estimate for the low fault is pretty much just a thumb suck. No one really yeah, sure. knows. I think in those old Kruger maps, they used to say a thousand or something. I mean, it's just a complete thumb suck. <laughs> Whereas there's probably more leopard in the Kruger Park than lion. I mean, I don't mm. know. It's, but, and they Could estimate, be. what, one and a half to 2,000 lions. So, yeah. no, I think they just, a lot more than we realize. Just <laughs> as soon yeah. as you start walking and you see the, the footprint evidence. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, Lee, um, I'm going to start wrapping up. How, if people want to join either your level one or now what are they called? Field guide. Um, apprentice field guide. Apprentice field apprentice guide field training guide. programs or your tracking programs or the, the new online tracking courses that you've put together. How would they find you? Uh, I, th I think probably the best way to get hold of me would be through our website, which is natureguidetraining.com. Simple, as, Simple that. as that. And there's lots of contact us buttons and things like that. Um, the tracker mentoring program, we're going to have a separate website for that. That's going to be a standalone uh, course and product that Kirsty and I will manage. Um, and we're hoping that other training providers like Lofalk Trails and other, other uh, companions out there are going to Jump help us with that whole thing. And yeah, we're hoping. We'll see how it goes. Okay, cool. But yeah. Well, thanks a lot. And guys, I could highly recommend Nature Guide Training and tracking with with Lee and Kersey um, I think what makes nature guide training you well not unique but special is that it's one of the few training providers where the original person who started the the organization still trains um, so you're getting unbelievable first-hand experience with a very experienced well-qualified uh, trainer so I would recommend joining one of their courses and thanks, <laughs> thanks for for the chat and uh, yeah we'll Chat again soon. Lovely. Thanks. <laughs> Cheers.